Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, at this time, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for this evening, and it is Ruben G. from Anaheim. Welcome. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Ruben. Uh, the most important thing I can share with you is I've been clean and sober since April the 2nd, 1985, and for that I'm grateful. And it's, uh, it's good to be here. It's good to be welcomed back. It's been about 15 years. Um, I was looking through the book, and uh, there's a lot of my heroes and Alcoholics Anonymous here in that book and people that, uh, that were very important to me in my early re- uh, recovery. And today, you know, my sponsor's in that book, and, uh, um, and the, the old-timer that, that 12 stepped me is in that book as well. And, and uh, welcome the newcomers that are here tonight. Uh, thank uh, Tyler and Tim for coming up down with me tonight. I told him on the way down here, this is not my favorite thing to do, um, you know, to speak in Alcoholics Anonymous or, or to drive long distances, but uh, um, but I'm grateful that I get to. I'm grateful that I was um, invited back, and thank you, everybody that's responsible for me being here tonight. Uh, I was taught to share a little bit about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today, and, and before I forget, um, before the meeting, we were standing out back, and we are talking to some of the residents, and is it Miguel? Yeah, it's coming up on six months sober, and he was talking to me. He said a word, um, just, you know, I just got six months sober. And uh, I don't know if it's like I just get in there or like the discount just. And I remember when I was new, an old timer came up to me and he said, how long are you sober? And I said, I just have two weeks. And he said, uh, you know, there's people that would um, give anything in the world just to have two weeks. And he taught me how to drop that word just. You know, because every day is important. Every day is a miracle. And uh, I was six months sober, exactly six months sober, just a little bit over six months. And I used to go to an old timers meeting in Bellflower. And there was people there. They got sober in the 40s. And and, uh, they were sober a long time. And they'd met some of the um, they'd met one of the co-founders and they they were hardcore. Uh, And there was they were a salty group. I saw somebody wearing a salty crew. Uh, shirt night, and uh, they they were not a touchy feely group of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, uh, they they were not. Uh, but the tough love they had, and they did not care how old you were. Um, and I was up at the podium one night, and I was talking about um, when am I going to get this thing? I was six months sober. I don't know when I'm going to get it. I don't know when this is, the miracle is going to happen. And I'm just going through this whole list of everything that I didn't have. And one of the old timers got me outside the meeting and he put his finger in my chest and he got right in my face and he was loud. I mean, he was loud, you know, and he was telling me that there's newcomers in the meeting. They were there tonight that did not need to listen to you, you know, uh, and all your craziness trying to figure out what you don't have. He said, talk about what you do have, you know, and that you have six months of sobriety and tell them how you got it, you know, that you didn't get six months by sitting on your ass. You know, that you've been to a meeting every day and you have a sponsor and you start working the steps and you don't have all the answers, you know, and the path isn't completely clear for you yet. And you haven't, you know, you haven't accepted this 100 percent that Alcoholics Anonymous is going to be a way of life or that's going to work forever. But you're doing it one day at a time. And that's all they need to hear, you know, and uh, he helped me because I didn't have to worry about what I didn't have anymore. And I just got grateful for what I do have, you know, and for what I have today. Oh, thank God that breeze is nice. Um <laughs> So anyways, I know there's a lot of people, uh, prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, I didn't know a lot about alcoholism. I knew what alcoholism was kind of in a way, but I didn't know a lot about alcoholism. Um, but then I, I went through my first drug rehab when I was 15 years old. And, uh, you know, when you come to meetings, especially now with a lot of the, the words, is they teach you a lot of things to attach and a lot of reasons for why we drank. You know, and people would go through like this whole long list of why they drank. I was less than, better than, you know, my skin was too tight. It was too loose. I was the wrong color. I was born in the wrong century, on the wrong planet. I didn't get the directions, you know, too many pimples, not enough pimples, too short, too tall. I mean, they just go through this whole stuff, right? And uh, I didn't have any of that when I took my first drink. 
I was uh, five years old. I was grew up on the west side of L.A., Venice, Santa Monica area. My uh, family ran restaurants. A lot of our friends had restaurants. And, uh, you know, they'd have those uh, punch and sangria. Um, wonderful combination. Uh, but there was always alcohol around. And I was five years old, and I took a drink, right? And so I wasn't trying to escape reality. You know, I didn't. I it was just there. I took a drink, and it went boom. I loved the effect that my first drink have. I have no um, concept uh, of what a social drink is. From the first drink, I drank for the effect. And I love the effect produced by alcohol. And I sought that from that point forward. Now, I wasn't drunk from the time I was five to the time I got to alcoholics. And I was by any means, right? But I was obsessed with it. And every time I saw anybody drinking or using anything, I knew why they were drinking it. Right? It was for the effect. And so I was irritable, restless, and discontent, seeking the ease and comfort of the first drink. And there's a lot of well-meaning people in my life that did not understand that that's all it was, is they should have given me a drink a lot earlier, <laughs> right? Because nothing was ever good enough after that point. I remember it was, the grass was always greener. It just was never right. And and I remember, um, up before I forget this, if, if love could keep me sober or would have kept me on the right track, I would not need Alcoholics Anonymous. I grew up in a family that had an abundance of love, right? Uh, there was no neglect in my family. There was alcoholism, but there was no neglect. I didn't have everything that I wanted, but I had everything that I needed. I was taken care of, right? Uh, by far, I didn't have everything that I wanted because there was never enough. <laughs> you know, uh, we weren't rich by any means. We were, my, my parents worked hard. My dad worked in a factory. Um, but uh, if good morals, good teachings, good examples – would have kept me from coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, I wouldn't be here. But I was never attracted to that. I was always attracted to the dark side of life. And um, But yeah, people are always trying to figure out what's wrong with Ruben. Why is he so angry? Why is he so... It's like I just was wanted that. Every chance I got, I snuck or stole a drink. And I was, uh, I was a, uh, what do you call those, altar boys. You know, and uh, I used to eat the host by the handful and uh, drink partake of the wine. And I knew that I was going to hell. Because you're not supposed to get drunk on the blood of Christ. But here I was trying to get a little buzz on. And <clears throat> I was uh, I was just was always kind of twisted, everything that I did. And they said, if you believed enough and you prayed enough, you would get what you wanted. That's what I heard, right? If you believed enough and you prayed enough, you'd get what you wanted. And uh, God and I separated in early age because I, I specifically prayed. And they said, be specific about what you want. And uh, Schwinn had just come out with their BMX bicycles, right? And I said, I want a chrome Schwinn bicycle with blue alloy wheels, you know, chrome molly. And um, and I wanted a brand new pair of Levi's and a pair of Vans for Christmas, right? Very specific. And for Christmas, I got an orange Huffy, a pair of Tough Skins, and a pair of Keds. And uh, I was pissed, Right. And everybody's like, what? You got a jeans, you got shoes, you got a bicycle. It's what you wanted, you know? And I let everybody know that I was upset. So me, God and I separated at that point. Anyways, um, I, I was just getting in trouble a lot. And again, well-meaning people were trying to fix me, right? They were trying to fix me. They did not know I just had already had untreated alcoholism. Now, when I started drinking and using the way I wanted to, it was 180 overnight. And it was just on. I found sex, drugs, and punk rock all at the same time. It was early 80s, and I just took off. And at the time, um, everything about it was magical. The scene, the places, the people, the things I was doing. And the time I would have told you, <clears throat> because I started running away, and I'd be gone days, weeks, or months at a time. Days, weeks, or months at a time. 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, just days, weeks, months, gone at a time. I have a 29-year-old, a 23-year-old, and a 17-year-old. As a parent, I have no idea... No idea the pain, the suffering, right, of, of a parent not knowing where their 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 year old kid is for days, weeks, or months at a time. But I was having fun. <laughs> I did not care what anybody else was thinking. I was enjoying myself. And at the time, I would have told you this same story that I told a lot of people that I was breaking away from an oppressive environment that was trying to control and mold me. They were just jealous of the way I was living, and they wanted to brainwash me and make me a drone like they were. You know, like their life was just, they dropped out of the womb, and they just crawled across the face of the earth until they dropped into the grave. Because I thought, if you didn't drink, life was just like one long gray tunnel, you know. And uh, and I was living in Technicolor, and everybody was just jealous of what I was doing. And after I got sober, 
and I did a fourth and a fifth step and I listened to people in the program and identified with them. What I found out was, was I just went wherever alcohol told me to go. And I went till the wheels fell off. And when everything was said and done and people were tired and there was nothing left, I'd crawl my way back home and I'd beg my way back into the house. And I'd tell them, I know what I did was wrong. I'm sorry. And then I start negotiating. And if you don't do this, I won't do this anymore. And if you don't do that, I won't do this. Right. And, and that's the way it was. And even in, when it was still working, there was indications that there was something wrong. Uh, at 14, uh, I, w- I, was, uh, I wasn't an emancipated minor, but I was close to it. Uh, by the time I was 14, my parents had just kind of given up. You know, They didn't like literally gave up. They just, especially my, my dad, my stepdad who raised me, was like he just it hurt too much. You know, It just hurt him too much to even hope that I was going to get different or do something different this time. And like he gave up in that way, like he couldn't try it anymore. And I wasn't an emancipated minor, but I was close to it. I got my parents to sign some papers to let me live with some friends. There was a family of Creoles, and I lived with them. And uh, uh, you know, I was just seeking this loaded way of life. And I remember uh, I was uh, it was a hot summer, like it was in June, and uh, we created this little party palace, like uh, in this garage. And it was the hot spot. You know, like literally it was the hot spot. Like we nailed all the doors shut and there was like one day in, one way out. And if you wanted to come in, you had to give me something, you know, and bands were in there and stuff like that. And I was in there for about six months. I don't remember coming out of that place. And uh, But I remember waking up on a Christmas morning and it rained like three months in a row. It was like in the early 80s when it was just raining all the time. And it was just me and a couple of those weenie dogs on a cold Christmas morning. You know, and uh, I was I was leaning uh, on a couch that had that soggy kind of curve to it, you know, and both those dogs had these tumors. So their little bellies were rolling on the ground and everybody had been going to the bathroom in the in the little garage thing that we had there. And I woke up that morning sick, hung over. And the, the reality, the truth of what I was doing was sitting on my chest. You know, we get those moments of clarity. And it's sitting there on my chest. And, and the reality that I woke up on that cold Christmas morning was this isn't right. Not because you tell me it's wrong or society or anybody else. I knew that at 14, I shouldn't be there alone. And that somewhere nearby, uh, that family who had no idea where I was at were waking up and there was something missing in their home on Christmas morning, you know, and that there was a sadness there like the sadness I had. The truth was there, Right. But somewhere there in the next half hour, hour, I found something to put into my system. And once I put whatever it was in my system, the lie came alive, you know, and it went from feeling sad about being alone to hoping that they were suffering. I hope they're learning their lesson for mistreating me or not understanding. And that's what alcohol started doing was it allowed me to believe the lie of the way I was living, you know, um, in and out, in and out, running around and, um, so I was um, 15 years old, and uh, I got in a car accident. I didn't steal the car. We borrowed a friend's car. Um, his dad had just restored a Cougar, and it, it just pristine condition. And his dad had left the keys hanging on the hook, which meant it's there, right? So we ran out of beer, and we went for a drive, you know, and we're driving. I wasn't driving, and, and uh, I was drinking. I had a bottle in my hand, and, and my friend was pumping the brakes, and all of a sudden, uh, my head's in the dashboard and the bottle split my chin open and, you know, everything. We caused a five-car collision. This little five-year-old girl in the car in front of us broke her back. And I just got out of the car and started instinctively breaking bottles. And the cops showed up and they took me to the hospital and I got arrested while I was in the hospital. And, uh, you know, uh, they took me to jail. And then they said, uh, the detectives came in. They said, well, um, we know that you didn't steal the car, but we don't know why nobody's coming to claim you right? You're 15. We can't get a hold of anybody that wants you or that claims you. This is, Something's wrong here. <laughs> like, you know, and uh, uh, so they ended up giving me three choices at that time was I could go into uh, t- to a psych unit, uh, which I'd been in one before and did not want to go back there. Uh, I don't like being confined and I know I'm not like them. You know, um, I, f- I feel like them. I act like them, but I'm not like them. Right. And I know that. There's a difference, right? And uh, so, the like the arts and crafts, it's crazy. I was over at my mom's house. We were helping her move about a year ago. Um, they moved from one house in Huntington Beach to another one. 
and she's still proud of the little ashtray I made when I was in the psych unit. You know, she holds this thing. It's like this dear thing, right? My brother and sister have like these awards and these trophies, and I got my ashtray from the psych unit. Um, but I knew that wasn't the place for me, and, and I didn't want to go to juvenile hall. And they said, well, you can go to this, psych, uh, this drug alcohol unit. And, um, and it was a, like a Monday, and I said, well, I have these tickets to go see Black Flag on Friday. And they said, well, we have a counselor who will go with you. Uh, just come on in. And uh, I said, okay. And as I went in, they locked the doors behind me, and I thought, <laughs> you know, I think they lied to me because it was a lockdown facility. And um, so I didn't go in there to get sober. I went in there just to beat the deal, get the heat off. <coughs> Within like 24 hours, I'd learned the AA lingo. Within 48 hours, people were saying, we really are impressed with how much you've changed and grown. You know, uh, you should think about becoming a junior counselor, you know, um, Within like 72 hours, I'd written this 32-page manifesto about all these wonderful things I was going to do now that I was sober, you know. It was no longer my job to judge the world, you know. It was let them judge me because I'm going to try to do th- – it was like this insane, crazy thing and like the ethics of child rearing. I just wrote this stuff because I was hearing all this recovery stuff, right? And I was just regurgitating out and people were like crying, like this is so wonderful, you, you know. Um, not to put anybody down in the recovery community, but it was like – It was like I was just parodying what people had said. And within the next 24 hours, I was loaded. I got loaded twice while I was in that lockdown detox. Now, if you're in a lockdown detox and you're getting loaded, there's an indication you just might have a problem, right? I'm not here to judge anybody. I'm just telling you my story because it's not in the brochure of let's get high and and detox, right? Um, I'm not much of a speed freak, but some friends, they came to see me and it was like like they came to my funeral, right? They were so sad. And they gave me a little bindle of cross tops. These, these little Benzedrine, they were speed just to come in pills, right? And um, Benzedrine, you could drink a lot longer on Benzedrine, right? And they used to be able to go over the border over here and get a thousand of them in little mini bennies. And uh, so they, these, they bring me in these pills, and I'm like wired. And I'm trying to sit in a group and do, uh, what is it, that meditation where they, you transcend yourself, right? <laughs> Right, wiggle your toes, and then you wiggle your ankles, and you move up. And what are you thinking? You know, are you in the boat or out of the boat? And I'm like, oh, I'm all over the place. And um, I taught my roommate how to huff uh, uh, industrial cleaners, and he'd never done any of that kind of stuff. And it was like classy highs like that. You know, it was like I didn't. Oh, I don't know when people started specializing either. Right? I know like today there's a lot of specialists. Like, oh, I would never do that. I only do this. Like they 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 like, qualify with what they did. If you had it, I did it. And there was a lot of times I did stuff like that. It really sucked. And then the next day I was doing it again, like Robitussin, right? Drinking cough syrup was never fun for me, but I drank a lot of Robitussin. Uh, there was an old time we used to talk about I drank so much Robitussin I probably shouldn't cough the rest of my life. And um, <laughs> I did not enjoy the hallucinations that Robitussin brought on. I did not enjoy the itching that I had where I was scratching myself raw and all that kind of stuff. And yet there I was the next night with my bottle of Robitussin, you know, whatever was there, you know, liquid paper. It just didn't, things we don't talk about in, in AA sometimes that, um, I'm Griff, I was talking about it one time and an old timer came up to me and goes, I'm glad you're talking about that stuff. Uh, because I used to work at my dad's restaurant in Santa Monica and the waiters would always complain that they kept getting bad bottles of whipped cream. Right. <laughs> and they had no idea that I would spend hours in the freezer sucking all those uh, whipped cream bottles dry of the nitrous oxide and just in there just laughing, ah, you know, and uh, just crazy stuff. And, and they really can never figure out. They wanted to fire their vendor because they kept bending bad bottles of, of uh, whipped cream. Anyways, so needless to say, I didn't stay sober when I got out of the detox. But what I did when I, in there, I met the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and they say you should find people that you identify with in the program well, be careful, because the only people I identified with in the program were those who did not want to stay sober, right? And those who did not want to change the way that they were living. And so I found the exact same people in the meetings on the west side of L.A. that were there that were in the clubs. And uh, there were some means. I started going to like different means like PADAP, Palmer Drug Abuse Program, NACA, MA, AA. There was means I went to the phone list 
they were only good for uh, drug connections, you know, <laughs> and it was like uh, the people that you met in the means. And one day I was loaded and the next day you were loaded and I was sober and you were sober in and out and all that kind of stuff. And um, what happened for the next year and a half is not anything that I planned or wanted to happen. Right. They say a belly full of booze and a head full of a don't mix. And once you know, you can never unknow. Once you know, you can never unknow. Now, once we know the true nature of our malady and who and what we are, it's never going to be the same. Because everybody I was with, they were just partying. I was trying to get a job done. I was hoping it would work, right? And they were just doing the deal. And I'm there with them. I don't identify with people that talk about how they uh, go places where people are drinking and using and they get grateful because they see... I can have fun without drinking because I see everybody making fools out of themselves and, and, you know, and, you know, uh, and they get sick and all that kind of stuff. I don't see that. Everything kind of goes gray and the spotlight just goes on the one that it's working for. I see the person that's drinking with impunity, that the magic's happening. As they take that drink, you can see the weight of the world falling off their shoulders and they stand starting a little, that smile starts to come up, you know. And everything's kind of okay. And I couldn't get that back. Next year and a half, I was in and out, more out than in. But my world turned upside down. I'd come to meetings loaded. And I'd argue with people in the program about what it takes to stay sober. You know, And if you said anything about my behavior in a meeting, boy, I could quote their traditions. You know? It was like, you're not practicing principles before personalities because you're judging me You know, as I'm interrupting the meeting and running around causing chaos and stuff like that. And then I'd go to places where everybody's getting loaded and I try to stay sober. None of those are what I want to do. You know what? Coming down in a meeting sucks, right? If anybody's ever in a meeting when you're coming down, it sucks. And it's like, why am I here? You know, and then I'm places. Um, I got to the point where I told people, if you leave me alone, I'd be all right that they actually left me alone. I, I always found well meaning people that like, tell them the same sad story that I, this time I meant, meant it, I wanted to change. Uh, I had learned my lesson. Uh, God had, it, it was God's divine plan to, for me to go get loaded again so that I could learn my lesson. And that this time I'd really hit bottom, you know, the rate right my bottom game that a lot of newcomers play. You know, it wasn't as bad as last time, or this time it was really worse. And this time I'm ready. It was like all that kind of stuff that was going on. And uh, um, they left me alone. I ended up in Carbon Canyon. Uh, which is not, um, it's in Orange County. And I met a girl while I was in detox, the first detox I was in. And they used to say that if you meet somebody when you're in rehab, right, the odds are good. So you just might fall in love while you're in rehab or detox, <laughs> right? But the goods are odd, right? We're a little off, you know, and uh, <laughs> I saw her once and she slept for like a week and then I saw her coming out of the room with, you know, that one week sleep thing and smoking a cigarette. And I knew she was the one for me. And, uh, I told her parents, we were both 16, 15. I told her parents uh, how if somebody would just give me a chance, I'd be all right. And they bought it. So they let me move into their basement in, in the Carving Canyon. And uh, um, I really wanted to get sober. I mean, I really wanted, I, I just didn't, I'm a 10th grade dropout. I've never gone back to school. And, and so when he got this job at a little golf course across from their house, I'm not a golfer. I had purple hair at the time. And I stuck my hair up in a hat and I went in there and, and, and uh, I got a job and I was reading my little black uh, 24 hours day book that they gave me in the thing. So every morning I'd read my book. I'd go across the street to the golf cart, golf course. And my job was to wash the golf carts and gas them up. And every morning uh, we had to go open up the gates and it was me and the stoner dude, you know, and uh, people that don't normally mix in those situations are all right. So this guy had long hair. He's a stoner. And every morning he'd ask me the same question as we were going around this golf course, opening up the gates. He goes, hey, man, you want to get high? And I, every morning I'd, like, I'd be insulted, you know, like incensed. Dude, I told you yesterday I don't get high. I'm in AA, you know, all this stuff. And like 15 minutes later when he's nice and stoned, I'm like, hey, you got anything left? And he'd say, no, I smoked it all up, right? And now I'm pissed, right? He's stoned. I'm sober. Work sucks. 
So the next thing they do is make everybody else around me as miserable as I am. So what I would do is I would fill up the golf carts with like half gas. So they run out of gas in the back nine. Uh, I learned how to play with the um, the governors on the motors where I'd make them either like super like painfully slow, you know, like eighth of a mile an hour kind of thing. Or I'd put them up all the way and like these old people would get in the golf cart and they step on the gas and they just take off and then they'd freak out and they hit the pedal and those things would start spinning, you know, and uh, that brought me such joy. Uh, switching people's golf clubs, you know, uh, just anything I could do to make you miserable was the only joy I had because uh, I don't do dry well. I know there's people, they work really hard at being dry. I mean, they do work really hard at being miserable sober. And I don't do dry well. I get loaded every time. So I'm grateful for the solution in Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Uh, if just saying nope to dope and putting the plug in the jug and uh, would work, I, I would not need Alcoholics Anonymous. I wouldn't have come here when I was new. So um, I did that for 90 days, right? Three or four meetings a week, hanging out with the people. And at 90 days, I was going insane. I had no idea what was wrong with me. No, I did not know it was untreated alcoholism. Did not know it was untreated alcoholism, right? I thought it was something deeper, more meaningful, you know, but it was just raw, right? It was just raw, and uh, I did what I always did. I got loaded, you know, and it wasn't the worst one, and it wasn't the best one. It just was, right? And I have no idea uh, when I woke up on April the, uh, 2nd of 1985 that it was my last day loaded, first day sober, I didn't wake up and uh, say, today is the day of the rest of my life. Now, my oldest, when he was uh, like three years old, I think, I don't know when it was, we had a, there's a baby, and uh, we did a bye-bye ceremony for his baba, you know, and we did this whole thing, and I, I had him get, gather up all his little bottles and walk over to the trash can and say, bye-bye, baba, and throw, I never had a bye-bye ceremony for my baba. <laughs> I didn't wake up and say, I'm staying sober for the rest of my life. I woke up sick. I was getting kicked out of the place I was in. I called my parents, asked if I could still use their insurance and if I could get another rehab. You know, um, I knew I needed to get well. I didn't know if I could get sober. I knew I needed to get well. I didn't know if I could get sober. I didn't know if Alcoholics Anonymous was going to work for me. I thought I tried it and that it just didn't work. Right? I thought I tried it and that it just didn't work. Um, I remember trying, uh, going through like intake and I was talking to this nurse and I really wanted to go back into this one rehab I'd been in because I knew the rules, which meant I knew how to break them. Right. I knew what I could get away with. And this place was not strict like the other ones. They didn't make you get a sponsor, you know, and they let you use the phone right away. I'm glad I got sober before mobile phones, you know, or I go to means every newcomer's got their head in the phone. They ain't listen nothing. When I got sober, they wouldn't let you use the phone. And when I, in the rehab, I was in for 30 days. They said, leave them alone. Give them a break. You don't need to get on the phone right away at 48 hours and tell them, Mommy, this time I got it. I learned my lesson. I'm on the right track, you know, but I need money when I get out. You know, you kind of throw that little last thing. I need, I'm going to go back to school. Will you co-sign for me and all this kind of stuff? Uh, but um, so I'm in this rehab. I don't know if I want to stay sober. I don't know if I can stay sober, right? Uh, I'm 16 years old. I weighed 120 pounds. I was a creature of the night. I didn't come out during the day much. I was pale white. I was translucent. I was so pale. My nerves were shot from drinking and using and not eating. Uh, it took me a long time sober to realize what that was. I was sober seven years before my twitching visibly went away. But when I was new, I would sit in meetings and my head would just go like this. And my shoulders were constantly rolling. And my legs were pumping like a couple pistons. It felt like somebody was drilling a three-inch hole from the top of my head down to the base of my spine. My skin was crawling. All the bones in my back felt like they were hollow, brittle, like they were going to break at any moment. And every time I laid down, that acid would go right up into my throat. And my head was whirling like a blender, you know. And occasionally a thought would come out. So I'd be having like three or four conversations with you that had nothing. They were like, oh, strung it along. I can't sleep at night. And um, I was uh, two weeks in that program, and I couldn't sleep at night. And I was just tired of laying there. You know, I was just tired of laying there, and my head's whirling and and my world's coming apart, and it just seems like everybody's happy, joyous, and free, and they got this stuff, and I don't got it. And uh, actually, that day, uh, I had been yelled at by, um, I, had, I had attack therapy on me, 
because I didn't know how it felt, right? I knew when I felt bad and not so bad, and I felt bad most of the time. I kind of cleaned that up. But like people would share their feelings. I feel happy, better than sad. Blah, blah, blah. They go to all this stuff, and I'm like, they said, I feel all right. I'm like, what do you mean all right? I said, I feel fine. I said, fine's not a feeling. I said, okay, you feel well. And they said, well, like a hamburger? You know, don't back me in the corner, man. I'm going to come out swinging, right? And uh, I said, you want to know how I feel? And the guy said, yeah, I want to know how you feel. That's why I asked you. I said, well, I don't trust you. I said, why not? I said, because you're not an alcoholic. And you say you understand us, but you don't. You know. Therefore, I don't choose how to share how I feel. And he goes, well, that's enough. And then he asked Susie, how do you feel? She goes, I don't trust you either. You know, So I'm not going to share my feelings. And um, so I was not a champ on the unit. Everybody hated me. Everybody hated me. And I'm sitting there that night, and I can't sleep. And I get up. And that day, they had the resident president. The guy that had the most time was like 90 days. And boy, this guy was like, a, you know, he was uh, on his way. Like, he was the example, right? He was the one they held up. And uh, I got up, and I'm wandering on the hallway. I don't know why I'm talking about this. I haven't talked about this in a while. But um, I'm wandering on the hallway, and they said, you got to go back to bed. I said, I ain't going back to bed. So, well, you're going to get in trouble. I said, what more trouble can I get in, right? What are you going to take away? They said, well, what's wrong? I said, I don't know. And they said, well, something's wrong if you can't lay in bed. I said, well, maybe I think I'm depressed. And they said, oh, we're going to put you on a suicide watch. You're going to lay down here on the hallway. I said, no, no, I don't feel like committing suicide. Homicide maybe, but not suicide. Now, I may die accidentally in the process, but I'm not thinking about killing myself, right? And they said, okay, well, you got to go back in. We're going to go get the resident president, all right? This guy had all the right words. So they bring this guy in. God bless him. I don't know where he's at today. But he tried his breast, and they brought him in there, and I'm looking at him, right? He's got nine days, and they sat him on the edge of my bed. And he's staring at me, and he goes, mm. and he's like uncomfortable as hell, right? And uh, he's all, this too shall pass. I'm all, really? <laughs> right? He's all, easy does it, right? He's just grasping at things that you would say in other places, and like everybody would tear up, like, oh, man. And uh, I'm looking at him, and he's just like, it was like finally he just got so uncomfortable, he just walked away. Now, that morning, Estelle, who was our van driver, she got sober down at the Weingart Center in, in Skid Row. She had eight years sober. She was tough. And I liked Estelle because uh, a few days earlier, it was a co-ed detox. Uh, the girls really wanted to go to a meeting where there was a lot of guys. All right. Yeah. So like, we want to go to meeting where there's a lot of guys. And she goes, really? She goes, I'll take you a place where there's a lot of guys. And they're like, yeah. And they got all dolled up, right? So it's the mid eighties and they were the big hair. They got the hair going and the makeup, right? And they're all got their dresses on. She takes us down to Skid Row. <laughs> and, uh, I loved it. Right. And, uh, so I kind of liked Estelle for doing that thing. And so Estelle comes walking in. And she sits on the edge of my bed, and she's looking at me. She's not saying nothing, right? There's a calm and a peace about her as she's sitting there on the edge of my bed, and she's looking at me in the eyes, and there's an understanding that's unsaid. And she put her hand on my leg, and she said, F them, right? I went, what? She's like, F them. She goes, I know that they don't understand. She goes, but I do. She goes, and I, don't, I can tell you this. I don't know how and when but this will pass, right? I don't know how and when, but this will pass. She says, if you just stay in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're going to be all right. And there was a difference between knowledge and experience, right? She had the experience. He had the knowledge. And uh, that next night, I was sitting in a big meeting. There was like 300 people. And people are walking by, and they're looking at me, and they're laughing, and I'm twitching, and I'm shaking, and I got my head thing going, and all that kind of stuff. And one person out of 300, they all, it was a speaker meeting. They're all wearing ties and suits, and they all looked like they knew each other. They were sober. They belonged, all this kind of stuff. And I felt like I was sitting in a glass plexa box separating me. I was sitting in the back wall. One guy out of 300 walked up to me, and he said, Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. Are you new? And I don't know why. I just said, yeah, I'm new. I didn't say, oh, I've been around for a year and a half. I said, yeah, I'm new. And he said, why are you here? And the Rolodex in my head started spinning. And I was trying to find the answer that would get you to shut up and leave me alone the fastest. I didn't want to give you the wrong answer where you got that look of excitement like, aha, I got you. You gave me the wrong answer. So now you have to listen to my lecture about why you shouldn't think, feel, or act that way, which I don't understand why you asked me and then tell me I shouldn't. 
right? And so this guy said, I'm trying to think about it. And the only thing that came out of my mouth is I said, I think I want to stay sober, right? I said, I think I want to stay sober. There's a lot of people that don't understand that, but alcoholics do. I was sober a long time, and I heard Clarence Snyder, one of the guys who started AA in Cleveland. If you ever get a chance to hear his tape, it's amazing. Dr. Bob 12-step this guy. And he's talking about he's sitting in the hospital with Sister Ignatia, and they're getting ready to bring Dr. Bob in and talk to him. And he was sitting in the room by himself, and he's looking up at a bottle of rubbing alcohol on the shelf, and he's looking around the room trying to find something in there where he can strain the alcohol uh, so that he doesn't get sick and kill himself, right? So he's obsessing on this bottle of rubbing alcohol and trying to find something. And the nurse, this poor little nurse walks in with a little bottle of pills and that uh, formaldehyde, formaldehyde, right? Yeah, formaldehyde. And uh, no, that's the stuff that when you're dead, right? One of those two, right? And he gets pissed. He's incensed. He's like, I'm here trying to get sober. And the first thing you want to do is give me drugs. And he laughed. He's like, at that moment, he was sitting in there thinking about how he could drink this. But then he's angry because somebody's trying to give him something. He said, that's a dilemma. That's what they talk about, the alcoholic dilemma. That's what we're talking about. It's opposite answers to the same question, and they're both valid. If I don't do this, I'm going to die. And if I do, I'm going to die. I want to stay sober, but I want to get loaded. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous if you feel like that. Right? There's nothing more complicated than that. It's just alcoholism. And it was so refreshing to know that. But when I told this guy, I think I want to stay sober, he looked at me for a second, and then he just smiled. And he gave me this big hug, and he said, Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, That's all we can promise you, is that you might stay sober if you do what we do, because I'm not going to promise you anything else. He said, If you want to stay sober, I'll show you, because talk's cheap. <coughs> if you want to stay sober, I'll show you, because talk's cheap. He said, Watch me. Watch me. I'll show you what I do. When was the last time you heard that? I hadn't heard that in a long time, right? And there's a lot of times, one of the dangerous things, uh, my grand sponsor one time, his name was Gene Duffy, and there's Don Pilo was in that book, God bless him. I'm going to tell you a story about Don Pilo in a second. He would talk about the most dangerous thing that he ever hears in Alcoholics Anonymous is somebody that tells a newcomer, you need to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. He said, when I got sober, I never heard anybody say that. He said, what we would say was, we are going to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. We are going to do this together. And that's what these old timers told me. I didn't have time to interview this guy, right? I, I, I might have had a list somewhere of like 100 questions to ask and to make sure he was qualified to be my sponsor. I never had a sponsor. And I don't know why to this day. But as soon as he told me that, I asked him for help. I said, will you be my sponsor? No clue. I didn't know how long he was sober. I didn't know where his home group was. You know, I didn't know where he lived. I didn't know what he did for a living. I didn't know anything. I just knew that he said he would help me right? Total blind faith. And the first thing that guy did was he pulled me off the back wall and pulled me right in the middle of alcoholics. Anonymous. He said, come here, come sit here with me. He introduced me to his sponsor. He introduced me to his home group. That was at 12 days sober at 42 days sober. I kicked out of that rehab because of my attitude. They were done with me. I called my sponsor and he was so excited, right? I said, Hey, I got kicked out of the rehab. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't got a place to live. I don't got a job. And he's like, that's great. He said, we're going on a camp out. You want to go on a camp out? And I'm like, what does going on a camp out have to do with everything that I just told you? And I just went, okay, right? I got nowhere else to go, you know? Uh, today, I got nowhere else to go. There's an old pair of shoes sitting outside that door right now, and I can step into them today. They're the same shoes I dropped off 34 years ago. They're still sitting out there. It's just worse. But I never gave up anything for Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous since 1985 has always been a step up. It's never been a step down. Prior to that, it was always a step down, right? So I'm in the car with this guy. I'm going to the camp out, right? And like after five minutes, I, I realized I just made a mistake. I don't like this guy. I don't like the way he talks. I don't like the way he walks. I don't like the kind of cigarettes he smokes. I don't like the music he listens to. He just wants to talk to AA, you know, and I keep trying to turn the radio on. He keeps turning it off, right? And we're driving and we're driving and driving. And we end up out in the desert, right? I'm a, I'm a city rat, right? And I'm a creature of the night. And we're out there in the middle of the day in the desert. And like within 15 minutes, I'm cherry tomato burnt red. Pissed. 
pissed. And I don't know how to tell this guy, take me home. All right. And that night they have a, a bonfire meeting. There's like 70 grown ass men out there in the middle of this desert. And they're having this spiritual meeting around this fire and they're all talking and I don't hear nothing. All I'm thinking about is if I step into the fire, I'm going to ruin their weekend. <laughs> right? And then it's all be over. Right? And when the meeting's over, I walked up to this guy that's supposed to be my sponsor and everybody kind of broke off in these little groups. Now, again, I never had a sponsor. I had no idea what a sponsor was. I heard people talk about a sponsor like, you know, when I jump off the cliff because I'm running self-will, as, I, as the ground's coming, my sponsor's always there with big soft gloves to catch me, right? My sponsor catches me and gently brings me down, dusts me off and tells me I am a special snowflake and everything's going to be all right. You know, you really have been misunderstood and the world has treated you wrongly. But if you stay sober and Alcoholics Anonymous through no effort of your own, everything's going to come together. And I, that's why I hear people talk about their sponsor, right? I, thought, I, thought, I swear to God, that's what I thought a sponsor was. Gets you out of problems. So I'm standing behind this guy and I'm kind of vibing out to him, right? I'm vibing out to him. This sucks. I got to go. You know, I, and, and he looks up at me. He goes, dude. He goes, you are driving me crazy, lurching over my shoulder like that. He goes, what's wrong? And I'm like, dude, you're supposed to know what's wrong. You're a horrible sponsor, right? I'm going to fire you, right? I'm thinking that in my head. And I got pissed. So I took off into the desert. And I, I, I'd seen a scorpion during the day. So I rolled up like a roly-poly in this uh, lawn chair. I had a flashlight and a big book. I didn't read anything. And I could just look back, and I could hear everybody laughing, and the fire was going. And after, like, I don't know how long I was at there, 45 minutes, an hour dawned on me. Nobody missed me, right? <laughs> Nobody's ringing like the alarm. We lost our newcomer. Like everybody spread out arm to arm, you know, let's comb the desert. Let's go find our newcomer, right? And I was like, I had no choice. I, I snuck back into camp. And when I snuck back in, I went, to, I went to sleep to the sound of laughter. When I woke up, I woke up to the sound of laughter. And that man in that book, Don Pila, was out there in the desert. And my sponsor, Keith, in there as well. And they were both at that camp out. And Don was talking. He was an old zoot suitor from East LA. He was a white Russian by birth, but he grew up with the white fence people out there. And he was he was telling stories about going down to the pike in the fifties and fighting the cowboys and the Okies and the, the guys from the Navy back in the day when the, the stilettos and uh and uh you know wrapping their wrists and all this and going to the pike in downtown LA and he was just punk rock as hell and he was this old guy, you know, and he was just telling his story. And the more he told his story, the more I started identifying, you know. And he looked at me and he said the same thing he told me a thousand times. He said, what's wrong with you? You know, and I told him, right, because I'd been listening to this guy talk. And somewhere there in the course of him telling his story, just to everybody else, he had answered questions I had and didn't know how to ask. And he was putting words to feelings that I had. He was just hitting all the right notes. So when he said, I know what you're going through, I knew that he knew. Two different generations, right, two different ways of life. And I told him what had happened, you know, and he stood up in his chair a little bit. He was wearing an old pair of bib overalls, no T-shirt, a fedora hat. He had a cane. He was smoking a cigar and he shed a tear and he's telling me, he goes, well, you know what, kid? He said, that was the first miracle of your sobriety. And you had no idea. You went somewhere that you had no idea you were going because you had no better options. And God put you where you could not run. He said, if you were in the city and you would hit that wall of fear like you did last night, you would have ran and you'd be loaded right now like you did a thousand times before. But God put you in a place where you couldn't run and you had to stay through and walk through that wall of fear. You know, and I don't know if it was for five seconds or five minutes. Could have been five seconds talking. I was talking to the guys on the way down here tonight. I don't know if it was for five seconds or five minutes, but my head and my body were in the exact same place at the exact same time. I had a quiet head and a quiet heart. And when he said, if you stay in Alcoholics Anonymous, you'll be all right. I believed him. And what happened for me out in the desert is the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous. To me, it's no more complicated than this. Just one drunken bum talking to another language of the heart. You know? And it was just one drunken bum talking to another. And he said, um, uh, he talked to me about a way of life, you know. And since 19, April 2nd, 1985, this has been a way of life for me. It's not always been easy, you know. There's been some bad days. You know, there's been some thirsty camel dry days, but I've had 34 great years. There's been some days where the only solution that seemed at the end of the day was to drink. You know, and I heard my friend Dan the other day, he's coming up on 36 years sober. There's a crew of us that got sober under 20, uh, under 18 actually. And uh, we didn't know that we were young. We just knew that we were done. 
and we were all attracted to these old timers. And they told us this, you're a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous first, and then you happen to be young, right? You're a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous first, and then you happen to be young. There's no specialty chapters, right? And there's uh, uh, about eight of us that have over 30 years sober that have been trudging this road together for a long time following these old timers. And these guys spoon fed us Alcoholics Anonymous, and they did not water it down. They would not water it down. They said, I was pissed one time. You know, because I'm about six months sober, right? And about six, between six months and a year, you start realizing, like, this might work, right? And if it works, it means I got to do it the rest of my life, right? Like, there's no exit date, you know? Some of these programs, like, you got this exit date. It's like, I'm really good, but in the back of your mind, you know, it's like 90 days, right? No more card, no more supervision. I'm gone, right? But for 90 days, I'm going to do this, right? Blah, blah, blah. The reality of it starts coming in. And I started, I was like, why do I got to do all this stuff? Right? Why do I got to do all this stuff? How come they get away with it? You know, how come this and how come that? And, he, and Don always kept it simple with me. And he said, did you ever drink beer? I said, yeah, I drank beer. He said, well, did you ever like just have a shot of beer with a tall glass of water? Because the beer was too strong. You know, a little <laughs> shot of beer, chase it with some water. Like, no. I, you know, sometimes I thought, this guy's kooky, right, when he's asking me these dumb questions. And he goes, hey, did you ever smoke any weed? I said, yeah, I smoked weed. He goes, well, did you ever put, like, grass clippings in your weed, you know, a little oregano, you know, mellow it out, maybe some mint, you know? I'm like, no. You know, now I'm getting insulted. Like, you, what are you saying, right? He goes, did you ever do, like, any speed or cocaine? I said, yeah. He goes, well, did you ever put, like, baby laxative in it, a little bit of that numbs it stuff, you know, just mellow it out some because it's too strong. I'm like, no. And he's like, well, now I'm getting pissed, right? Like, what, what's he getting at? And he said, why not? I said, because I always wanted the best stuff, right? I wanted, to, I wanted what would get me drunk the fastest, right? I was a volume drinker, like percentage volume. You know, I wasn't like, you know, I just drank 48 beers and I'm out drunk. It was like, <laughs> you're doing something wrong, bro. You know, I'd rather drink this you know, peppermint schnapps and get drunk right now than drink this whole, right? So that's the kind of drinker I am. I drink for oblivion and it's the fastest, right? I might get social after I'm drunk, but until I'm drunk, we ain't talking, right? I'm just getting a job done. And he's like, why not? I said, because I wanted the best stuff. He said, now, why would you do that with your sobriety in your life? He said, why would you step on it? Why would you water it down? Why would you cut it? You didn't do it to get loaded. Why would you do it in sobriety? And I haven't looked back since. You know, and again, there's been some tough days, right? But there's been 34 great years. My wife's got 32 years in the program, 31 years, sorry, and uh, part of an active home group. And I have a full heart tonight, you know, and there's a pretty good chance that when I get home tonight and I put my head on that pillow, I'm going to be asleep within five minutes. I'm tired, right? But it's a good tired, right? And I remember when I was new that that was beyond my wildest drunken dreams. All right. It was just to be able to go home and sleep with the quiet head and the quiet heart, you know, just to lay down. The icing on the cake, the bonus, the thing that I had no idea was here when I came here that I wasn't looking for was that tonight, because I'm here with you, nobody's losing sleep over me anymore. All right. They're not waiting up at night. They're not having their prayer parties, praying the rosary because they don't know where their kid's at. I'm not waiting for that phone call in the middle, middle of the night. Come identify your kid's body or come get me out of jail, right? They get to sleep easy because I'm here with you. In 34 years, there's nobody in my family that begrudges my way of recovery. They've never said, you do too much Alcoholics Anonymous, you should stay home. To this day, they're like, go, right? Because they're fully aware that the only reason that I'm even in their life is because of Alcoholics Anonymous and sobriety because of this way of life, because the old timers taught me when I was new how to take it home. And they said, it's real easy to work a great program when you're in a meeting, but you got to take it home, you know, and stop saying you're sorry. They all know you're sorry. They taught me how to take sobriety home and how to be an example. Wasn't easy, you know, wasn't easy. Um, I'll tell you this story, then I'll shut up. Uh, so we're, I'm about a, these guys, there's a lot of unity in my home group right now, and I'm really close to some of the guys. My sponsor has been sick, and he's been in our prayers. And, and uh, 
um, some of my peers, we've really been close together. Now, every one of us did not like each other when we were new. In fact, we hated each other. We would not have gotten loaded together, but we were in the same home group, right? And we had, to, we had a common problem and a common answer. But we'd be like driving down the road. We didn't have a lot of cars back then, so you didn't have like a lot of options, you know? Uh, so like if somebody was driving, you got in the car, there were like six, seven, eight guys in a little car, right? And, we're, and so nobody else wanted us. So we were all making minimum wage. We got a two-bedroom apartment. There was five of us, one bathroom, no privacy, right? You couldn't lock the bathroom door, no refrigerator. Uh, we were like living good. Uh, our, uh, we were talking about the other day. It's like I ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for months. We were like all survivors, and it's like some of the best time in my life. I live good today. I, I, I got an amazing job, and I guess I've gone all over the world now. Call I just got this amazing life, but like at a year sober, there's like five of us that hate each other, and we're like working the steps all the time on each other, you know. And it was my sponsor. That was the greatest period of growth. I do these ten step on these guys, and he's like, "You know why you're so angry at him?" I'm like, "No," he's like, "Cause he's just like you. You're living a house full of mirrors." <laughs> And it was like, yeah, it was amazing. We were all on a budget, you know, macaroni and cheese, chili, top ramen. We all, my friend liked making chilaroni, uh, tuna roni. You know, it was like, and it was just, it was disgusting, right? But we all had our thing, right? And uh, and we were all survivors. And I can tell you, 34 years later, we still have our all thing, and we're all survivors, right? And what bonded us, the way the bond that we have is just simply alcohols. And I'm thinking of that because I've got the guys in the house here, you know, the newcomers, is that there's people today, the guys that were my best bros in my first 30, 60, 90 days, they left, right? And it was the guys who I had no identity with, we didn't come the same thing, that today are my best friends because we had a common problem as the desperation, that gift of desperation. And what we learned was to nurture that in with each other. And when I used to get angry at the old timers because they weren't practicing principles before personalities because they were telling me what I was doing wrong, what I understand today is that principles before personalities is that just that one drunken bum loving the other, you know, is, uh, dude, I don't know what we're doing here, but let's do it together. You know, um, a couple years ago, and I'll say this and I'll really shut up. My friend Dan, um, I was sitting out front of a meeting. I was like 26 years sober. And I was having a bad day, you know, like some things are just kind of collapsed around me. And Dan walked up to me, right? And he's a, <laughs> he just walked up to me and he's like, just slugs me in the shoulder. Went, bam. And he's like, let's go. You know, I was in the parking lot getting ready to go in the meeting. And like, he punched me hard and it popped my head out. Right. And he's like, let's go. And it was like, I didn't need somebody saying what's wrong. You know? Let's talk about this. You want to share your feelings? You want to talk about what you're thinking about? What I needed was that punch from a guy that see me. And in that punch, right, it may seem a little bit harsh, right? I'm not telling you to go around and punch each other. <laughs> but in that punch, it said the whole world is, dude, I know what you're going through. And we've been here a long time, right? But standing out here in the parking lot is not the answer, Right? Stand out here and trying to figure it out by yourself is not the answer. It's inside the room. Come on in, right? And that was the most loving action he could give me. Sometimes we need somebody to hug us, and sometimes we just need somebody to kick us in the butt, right? Get us up and going. Uh, God bless you, and I hope you're here. Nobody has to drink again. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.